Relax and listen to the voice. Donkey Cabbages. There was once a young huntsman who went into the forest to lie in wait. He had a fresh and joyous heart, and as he was going thither, whistling upon a leaf, an ugly old crone came up, who spoke to him and said, Good day, dear huntsman. Truly you are merry and contented, but I am suffering from hunger and thirst. Do give me an alms. The huntsman took pity on the poor old creature, felt in his pocket, and gave her what he could afford. He was then about to go further, but the old woman stopped him and said, Listen, dear huntsman, to what I tell you. I will make you a present in return for your good heart. Go on your way now, but in a little while you will come to a tree whereon nine birds are sitting, which have a cloak in their claws, and they are fighting for it. Take your gun and shoot into the midst of them. They will let the cloak fall down to you, but one of the birds will be hurt and will drop down dead. Carry away the cloak. It is a wishing cloak. When you throw it over your shoulders, you only have to wish to be in a certain place, and you will be there in the twinkling of an eye. Take out the heart of the dead bird and swallow it whole, and every morning early, when you get up, you will find a gold piece under your pillow. <laughs> the huntsman thanked the wise woman and thought to himself, Well, those are fine things that she has promised me, if all does but come true. And verily, when he had walked about a hundred paces, he heard in the branches above him such a screaming and twittering that he looked up and saw there a swarm of birds who were tearing a piece of cloth about with their beaks and claws, and tugging and fighting as if each wanted to have it all to himself. Well, said the huntsman, this is amazing. It has really come to pass, just as the old crone foretold. And he took the gun from his shoulder, aimed and fired right into the midst of them, so that the feathers flew about. The birds instantly took to flight with loud outcries, but one dropped down dead, and the cloak fell at the same time. Then the huntsman did as the old woman had directed him, cut open the bird, sought the heart, swallowed it down, and took the cloak home with him. The next morning when he awoke, the promise occurred to him, and he wished to see if it had also been fulfilled. When he lifted up the pillow, the gold piece shone in his eyes, and the next day he found another, and so it went on every time he got up. He gathered together a heap of gold, but at last he thought, Of what use is all my gold to me if I stay at home? I will go forth and see the world. He then took leave of his parents, buckled on his huntsman's pouch and gun, and went out into the world. It came to pass that one day he traveled through a dense forest, and when he came to the end of it, in the plain before him stood a fine castle. An old woman was standing with a wonderfully beautiful maiden, looking out of one of the windows. The old woman, however, was a witch, and said to the maiden, There comes one out of the forest, who has a wonderful treasure in his body. We must filch it from him, daughter of my heart. It is more suitable for us than for him. He has a bird's heart about him, by means of which a gold piece lies every morning under his pillow. She told her what she was to do to get it, and what part she had to play, and finally threatened her, and said with angry eyes, And if you do not attend to what I say, it will be the worse for you. Now when the huntsman came nearer, he noticed the maiden, and he said to himself, well, I have traveled about for such a long time, I will take a rest for once, and enter that beautiful castle. I have certainly money enough. Nevertheless, the real reason was that he had caught sight of the beautiful, picturesque maiden. He entered the house and was well received and courteously entertained. Before long he was so much in love with the young witch that he no longer thought of anything else and only saw things as she saw them and liked to do what she desired. The old woman then said, Now, we must have the bird's heart. You will never miss it. She brewed a potion and when it was ready, poured it into a goblet and gave it to the maiden who was to present it to the huntsman. She did so, saying, Now, my dearest, drink to me. So he took the goblet, and when he had swallowed the draft, he brought up the heart of the bird. The girl had to take it away secretly and swallow it herself, for the old woman would have it so. Thenceforward he found no more gold under his pillow, but it lay instead under that of the maiden, from whence the old woman fetched it away every morning, 
but he was so much in love and so befooled that he thought of nothing else but passing his time with the girl. Then the old witch said, We have the bird's heart, but we must also take the wishing cloak away from him. The girl answered, We will leave him that. He has lost his wealth. The old woman was angry and said, Such a mantle is a wonderful thing and is seldom to be found in this world. I must and will have it. She gave the girl several blows and said that if she did not obey, it should fare ill with her. So she did the old woman's bidding, placed herself at the window, and looked on the distant country, as if she were very sorrowful. The huntsman asked, Why do you stand there so sorrowfully? Ah, my beloved, was her answer, Over yonder lies the Gauntlet Mountain, where the precious stones grow. I long for them so much that when I think of them, I feel quite sad. But who can get them? Only the birds. They fly and can reach them. But a man, never. Have you nothing else to complain of? said the huntsman. I will soon remove that burden from your heart. And with that, he drew her under his mantle, wished himself on the Garnet Mountain, and in the twinkling of an eye they were sitting on it together. Precious stones were glistening on every side so that it was a joy to see them, and together they gathered the finest and costliest of them. Now the old woman had, through her sorceries, contrived that the eyes of the huntsman should become heavy. He said to the maiden, We will sit down and rest a while. I am so tired that I can no longer stand upon my feet. Then they sat down, and he laid his head in her lap, and he fell asleep. When he was asleep, she unfastened the mantle from his shoulders and wrapped herself in it, picked up the garnets and stones, and wished herself back at home with them. But when the huntsman had slept his fill and awoke and perceived that his sweetheart had betrayed him and left him alone on the wild mountain, he said, Oh, what treachery there is in this world! And he sat down there in trouble and sorrow, not knowing what to do. The mountain belonged to some wild and monstrous giants who dwelt there on and lived their lives there, and he had not sat long before he saw three of them coming towards him, so he lay down as if he were sunk into a deep sleep. Then the giants came up, and the first kicked him with his foot and said, What sort of an earthworm is this, lying here contemplating his inside? And the second said, Step upon him and kill him. But the third said contemptuously, That would indeed be worth your while. Just let him live. He cannot remain here. And when he climbs higher towards the summit of the mountain, the clouds will lay hold of him and bear him away. So saying, they passed by. But the huntsman had paid heed to their words, and as soon as they were gone, he rose and climbed up to the summit of the mountain, and when he had sat there a while, a cloud floated towards him, caught him up, carried him away, and traveled about for a long time in the heavens. Then it sank lower and let itself down on a great cabbage garden, girt round by walls, so that he came softly to the ground on the cabbages and vegetables. Then the huntsman looked about him and said, If I had but something to eat, I am so hungry, and to proceed on my way from here will be difficult. I see here neither apples nor pears, nor any other sort of fruit. Everywhere nothing but cabbages. But at length, he thought, in a pinch I can eat some of the leaves. They do not taste particularly good, but they will refresh me. With that, he picked himself out a fine head of cabbage and ate it. But scarcely had he swallowed a couple of mouthfuls than he felt very strange and quite different. Four legs grew upon him a thick head and two long ears, and he saw with horror that he had changed into an ass. Still, as his hunger increased every minute, and as the juicy leaves were suitable to his present nature, he went on eating with great zest. At last, he arrived at a different kind of cabbage, but as soon as he had swallowed it, he again felt a change, and resumed his former human shape. Then the huntsman lay down and slept off his fatigue. When he awoke the next morning, he broke off one head of the bad cabbages and another of the good ones, and he thought to himself, This shall help me to get my own again and punish treachery. Then he took the cabbages with him, climbed over the wall, and went forth to look for the castle of his sweetheart. After wandering about for a couple of days, he was lucky enough to find it again. He dyed his face brown so that his own mother would not have known him. He begged for shelter. I am so tired, he said that I can go no further. The witch asked, Who are you, countrymen, and what is your business? Well, I am a king's messenger, and was sent out to seek the most delicious salad which grows beneath the sun. 
I have even been so fortunate as to find it, and am carrying it about with me. But the heat of the sun is so intense that the delicate cabbage threatens to wither, and I do not know if I can carry it any further. When the old woman heard of the exquisite salad, she was greedy and said, Dear countryman, let me just try this wonderful salad. Why not? answered he. I have brought two heads with me, and will give you one of them and he opened his pouch and handed her the bad cabbage. The witch suspected nothing amiss, and her mouth watered so for this new dish that she herself went into the kitchen and dressed it. When it was prepared, she could not wait until it was set on the table, but took a couple of leaves at once and put them in her mouth. Hardly had she swallowed them than she was deprived of her human shape, and she ran out into the courtyard in the form of an ass. Presently, the maidservant entered the kitchen, saw the salad standing there ready prepared, and was about to carry it up. But on the way, according to habit, she was seized by the desire to taste, and she ate a couple of leaves. Instantly, the magic power showed itself, and she likewise became an ass and ran out to the old woman, and the dish of salad fell to the ground. Meantime, the messenger sat beside the beautiful girl, and as no one came with the salad, and she was also longing for it, she said, I don't know what has become of the salad. The huntsman thought, The salad must have already taken effect, and he said, I will go to the kitchen and inquire about it. As he went down, he saw the two asses running about in the courtyard. The salad, however, was lying on the ground. Oh, all right, said he. The two have taken their portion. And he picked up the other leaves, laid them on the dish, and carried them to the maiden. I bring you the delicate food myself, said he, in order that you may not have to wait longer. Then she ate of it, and was, like the others, immediately deprived of her human form, and ran out into the courtyard in the shape of an ass. After the huntsman had washed his face, so that the transformed ones could recognize him, he went down into the courtyard and said, Now you shall receive the wages of your treachery, and he bound them together, all three with one rope, and drove them along until they came to a mill. He knocked at the window. The miller put out his head and asked what he wanted. I have three unmanageable beasts, answered he, which I don't want to keep any longer. Will you take them in, and give them food and stable room, and manage them as I tell you, and then I will pay you what you ask? The miller said, well, Why not? But how am I going to manage them? The huntsman then said that he was to give three beatings and one meal daily to the old donkey, and that was the witch. One beating and three meals to the younger one, which was the servant girl, and to the youngest, which was the maiden, no beatings and three meals, for he could not bring himself to have the maiden beaten. After that he went back into the castle and found therein everything he needed. After a couple of days the miller came and said he must inform him that the old ass which had received three beatings and only one meal daily was dead. The two others, he continued, are certainly not dead, and are fed three times daily, but they are so sad that they cannot last much longer. The huntsman was moved to pity. He put away his anger and told the miller to drive them back again to him. And when they came, he gave them some of the good salad, so that they became human again. The beautiful girl fell on her knees before him and said, Ah, oh, my beloved, forgive me for the evil I have done to you. My mother drove me to it. It was done against my will, for I love you dearly. Your wishing cloak hangs in the cupboard, and as for the bird's heart, I will take a vomiting potion. But he thought otherwise and said, Keep it. It is all the same, for I will take you for my true wife. So the wedding was celebrated, and they lived happily together until their death. The Three Brothers There was once a man who had three sons, and nothing else in the world but the house in which he lived. Now each of the sons wished to have the house after his father's death, but the father loved them all alike, and did not know what to do. He did not wish to sell the house, because it belonged to his forefathers, else he might have divided the money amongst them. At last he conceived a plan, and he said to his sons, Go into the world and try each of you to learn a trade. And when you all come back, he who makes the best masterpiece shall have the house. The sons were well content with this, and the eldest determined to be a blacksmith, the second a barber, and the third a fencing master. 
They fixed a time when they should all come home again, and then each went his way. It chanced that they all found skillful masters who taught them their trades well. The blacksmith had to shoe the king's horses, and he thought to himself, The house is mine, without a doubt. The barber shaved only distinguished peoples, and he too already looked upon the house as his own. The fencing master suffered many a blow, but he grit his teeth and let nothing vex him. For, said he to himself, If you are afraid of a blow, you'll never win the house. When the appointed time had gone by, the three brothers came back home to their father, but they did not know how to find the best opportunity for showing their skill, so they sat down and consulted together. As they were sitting thus, all at once a hare came running across the field. Ah, just in time, said the barber, so he took his basin and soap, and lathered away until the hare drew near. Then he soaked and shaved off the hare's whiskers whilst he was running at the top of his speed, and did not even cut his skin or injure a hair on his body. Well done, said the old man. If the others do not make a great effort, the house is yours. Soon after, up came a nobleman in his coach, dashing along at full speed. Now you'll see what I can do, father, said the blacksmith. So away he ran after the coach, took all four shoes off of the feet of one of the horses whilst it was galloping, and put on four new shoes without stopping him. You are a fine fellow, and as clever as your brothers, said his father. I do not know to which I ought to give the house. Then a third son said, Father, let me have my turn, if you please. And as it was beginning to rain, he drew his sword and flourished it backwards and forwards above his head so fast that not a drop fell upon him. It rained still harder and harder, till at last it came down in torrents, but he only flourished his sword faster and faster, and remained as dry as if he were sitting in his house. When his father saw this, he was amazed and said, This is the masterpiece. The house is yours. His brothers were satisfied with this, as was agreed beforehand, and as they loved one another very much, they all three stayed together in the house, followed their trade, and as they had learned them so well and were so clever, they earned a great deal of money. Thus they lived together happily until they grew old, and at last, when one of them fell sick and died, the two others grieved so sorely about it that they also fell ill, and soon after died. And because they had been so clever and had loved one another so much, they were all laid in the same grave. The Devil and His Grandmother There was a great war, and the king had many soldiers, but gave them small pay, so small that they could not live upon it, so three of them agreed among themselves to desert. One of them said to the others, If we are caught, we shall be hanged on the gallows. How shall we manage it? Another said, Look at that great cornfield. If we were to hide ourselves there, no one could find us. The troops are not allowed to enter it, and tomorrow they are to march away. They crept into the corn. Only the troops did not march away, but remained lying all around about it. They stayed in the corn for two days and two nights, and were so hungry that they all but died. But if they had come out, their deaths would have been certain. Then they said, What is the use of our deserting if we have to perish miserably here? But now a fiery dragon came flying through the air, and it came down to them, and asked why they had concealed themselves there. They answered, We are three soldiers who have deserted because the pay was so bad, and now we shall have to die of hunger if we stay here, or to dangle on the gallows if we go out. If you will serve me for seven years, said the dragon, I will convey you through the army so that no one shall seize you. We have no choice and we are compelled to accept, they replied. Then the dragon caught hold of them with his claws and carried them away through the air over the army and put them down again on the earth far from it. But the dragon was no other than the devil. He gave them a small whip and said, Whip with it and crack it, and then as much gold will spring up around about you as you can wish for. Then you can live like great lords, keep horses, and drive your carriages. 
But when the seven years have come to an end, you are my property. Then he put before them a book, which they were all three forced to sign. But first I will ask you a riddle, said he. And if you can guess it, you shall be free and released from my power. Then the dragon flew away from them, and they went away with their whip, had gold in plenty, ordered themselves rich apparel, and traveled about the world. Wherever they were, they lived in pleasure and magnificence, rode on horseback, drove in carriages, ate and drank, but did nothing wicked. The time slipped quickly by, and when the seven years were coming to an end, two of them were terribly anxious and alarmed, but the third took the affair easily and said, Brothers, fear nothing. I still have my wits about me. I shall guess the riddle. They went out into the open country and sat down, and two of them pulled sorrowful faces. Then an aged woman came up to them who inquired why they were all so sad. Well, they said, what has it got to do with you? After all, you cannot help us. Who knows, said she. Just confide your trouble to me. So they told her that they had been the devil's servants for nearly seven years, and that he had provided them with gold as though it were hay, but that they sold themselves to him and were forfeited to him if at the end of seven years they could not guess a riddle. The old woman said, If you are to be saved, one of you must go into the forest. There he will come to a fallen rock which looks like a little house. He must enter that, and then he will obtain help. The two melancholy ones thought to themselves, Well, that will still not save us, and they stayed where they were. But the third, the merry one, got up and walked on in the forest until he found the rock house. In the little house, a very aged woman was sitting, who was the devil's grandmother, and asked the soldier where he came from and what he wanted there. He told her everything that had happened, and as he pleased her well, she had pity on him and said she would help him. She lifted up a great stone which lay above a cellar and said, Conceal yourself there. You can hear everything that is said here. Only sit still and do not stir. But when the dragon comes, I will question him about the riddle. He tells everything to me, so listen carefully to his answer. At twelve o'clock at night, the dragon came flying thither and asked for his dinner. The grandmother laid the table and served up food and drink so that he was pleased, and they ate and drank together. In the course of conversation, she asked him what kind of day he had had and how many souls he had gotten. Nothing went very well today, he answered, but I have laid hold of three soldiers. I have them safe. Indeed, three soldiers, they're clever. They may escape you yet. The devil said mockingly, They are mine. I have set them a riddle, which they will never be able to guess. What riddle is that? she inquired. I will tell you. In the great North Sea lies a dead dogfish. That shall be your roast meat, and the rib of a whale shall be your silver spoon, and a hollow old horse's hoof shall be your wine glass. When the devil had gone to bed, the old grandmother raised up the stone and let out the soldier. Did you give heed to everything? Yes, he said. I know enough and will save myself. Then he had to go back another way, through the window, secretly and with all speed to his companions. He told him how the devil had been outwitted by the old grandmother and how he had learned the answer to the riddle. Then they were all delighted, and of good cheer, and took the whip, and whipped so much gold for themselves that it ran all over the ground. When the seven years had finally gone by, the devil came with the book, showed the signatures, and said, I will take you with me to hell. There you shall have a meal. If you can guess what kind of roast meat you will have to eat, you shall be free and released from your bargain and you may keep the whip as well. Then the first soldier began and said, In the great North Sea lies a dead dogfish. That no doubt is the roast meat. The devil was angry and began to mutter, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And he asked the second, But what will your spoon be? The rib of a whale. That's to be our silver spoon. The devil made a wry face. Again, the devil growled. <clears throat> and he said to the third, And do you also know what your wine glass is to be? An old horse's hoof is to be our wine glass. Then the devil flew away with a loud cry, and he had no more power over them. But the three kept the whip, whipped as much money for themselves with it as they wanted, and they lived happily until their end. Ferdinand the Faithful Once upon a time lived a man and a woman who so long as they were rich had no children, but when they were poor they got a little boy. They could find no godfather for him, so the man said he would just go to another village to see if he could get one there. On his way he met a poor man who asked him where he was going. He said he was going to see if he could get a godfather, because he was so poor that no one could stand his godfather for him. Oh, said the poor man. You are poor, and I am poor. I will be godfather for you, but I am so badly off, I can give the child nothing. Go home and tell the midwife that she is to come to the church with the child. When they all got to the church together, the baker was already there, and he gave the child the name of Ferdinand the Faithful. When he was going out of the church, the beggar said, Now go home. I can give you nothing, and you likewise ought to give me nothing. But he gave a key to the midwife, and told her when she got home she was to give it to the father, who was to take care of it until the child was fourteen years old. And then he was to go on to the heath where there was a castle which the key would fit, and that all which was therein should belong to him. Now, when the child was seven years old, and had grown very big, he once went to play with some other boys, and each of them boasted that he had gotten more from his godfather than the other. But the child could say nothing, and was vexed, and went home and said to his father, Did I get nothing at all then, from my godfather? Oh yes, said the father, you have a key. If there is a castle standing on the heath, just go to it and open it. Then the boy went thither, but no castle was to be seen or heard of. After seven years more, when he was fourteen years old, he again went thither, and there stood the castle. When he had opened it, there was nothing within but a horse, a white one. Then the boy was so full of joy, because he had a horse, that he mounted on it and galloped back to his father. Now I have a white horse, and I will travel, said he. So he set out, and as he was on his way, a pen was lying in the road. At first he thought he should pick it up, but then again he thought to himself, You should leave it lying there. You will easily find a pen where you're going, if you have need of one. As he was thus riding away, a voice called after him, Ferdinand the Faithful, take it with you. He looked around, but saw no one, so he went back again and picked it up. When he had ridden a little way further, he passed by a lake, and a fish was lying on the bank, gasping and panting for breath. So he said, Wait, my dear fish, I will help you get into the water. And he took hold of it by the tail and threw it into the lake. Then the fish put its head out of the water and said, As you have helped me out of the mud, I will give you a fruit. When you are in any need, play on it, and I will help you. And if ever you let anything fall in the water, just play the flute, and I will reach it out to you. Then he rode away, and there came to him a man who asked him where he was going. Oh, just on to the next place. What is your name? Ferdinand the Faithful. So, then we have almost the same name. I am called Ferdinand the Unfaithful. And they both set out to an inn in the nearest place. Now it was unfortunate that Ferdinand the Unfaithful knew everything that the other had ever thought, and everything he was about to do. He knew it by means of all kinds of wicked arts. 
There was in the inn an honest girl who had a bright face and behaved very prettily. She fell in love with Ferdinand the Faithful because he was a handsome man, and she asked him whether he was going. Oh, I'm just traveling round about, said he. Then she said he ought to stay there, for the king of that country wanted an attendant or an outrider, and he ought to enter his service. He answered that he could not very well go to anyone like that and offer himself. Then the maiden said, Oh, but I will soon do that for you. And so she went straight to the king and told him that she knew of an excellent servant for him. He was well pleased with that and had Ferdinand the Faithful brought to him and wanted to make him his servant. He, however, liked better to be an outrider, for where his horse was, there he always wanted to be. So the king made him an outrider. When Ferdinand the Unfaithful learned that, he said to the girl, What? Do you help him and not me? Oh, said the girl, I will help you too. She thought, I must keep friends with that man, for he is not to be trusted. She went to the king and offered him as a servant, and the king was willing. Now when the king met his lords in the morning, he always lamented and said, Oh, if I only had my love with me. Ferdinand the Unfaithful, however, was always hostile to Ferdinand the Faithful. So once, when the king was complaining thus, he said, You have the outrider, send him away to get her, and if he does not do it, his head must be struck off. Then the king sent for Ferdinand the Faithful, and told him that there was, in this place or in that place, a girl that he loved, and that he was to bring her to him, and if he did not do it, he should die. Ferdinand the Faithful went into the stable to his white horse, and complained and lamented. Oh, what an unhappy man I am! Then someone behind him cried, Ferdinand the Faithful, why do you weep? He looked around but saw no one, and went on lamenting. Oh, my dear little white horse, now must I leave you, now I must die. And then someone cried once more, Ferdinand the Faithful, why do you weep? And then, for the first time, he was aware that it was his little white horse who was putting that question. Do you speak, my little white horse? Can you do that? He said. I am to go this place and that, and am to bring the bride. Can you tell me how I am to set about it? And then answered the white horse. Go to the king, and say if he will give you what you must have, you will get her for him. And if he will give you a ship full of meat, and a ship full of bread, it will succeed. Great giants dwell on the lake, and if you take no meat with you for them, they will tear you to pieces, and there are large birds which would pluck the eyes out of your head if you had no bread for them. Then the king made all of his butchers in the land kill, and all the bakers bake, that the ships might be filled. When they were full, the little white horse said to Ferdinand the Faithful, Now mount me, and go with me into the ship, and then when the giants come, say, Peace, peace, my dear little giants. I had thought of ye, something I have brought for ye. And when the birds come, you shall again say, Peace, peace, my dear little birds. I have thought of ye, something I have brought for ye. Then they will do nothing to you, and when you come to the castle, the giants will help you. Then go up to the castle, and take a couple of giants with you. There the princess lies sleeping. You must, however, not awaken her, but the giants must lift her up and carry her in her bed to the ship. And now everything took place as the little white horse had said, and Ferdinand the Faithful gave the giants and the birds what he had brought with him for them, and that made the giants willing, and they carried the princess in her bed to the king. And when she came to the king, she said she could not live, she must have her writings, which had been left in her castle. Then, by the instigation of Ferdinand the Unfaithful, Ferdinand the Faithful was called, and the king told him he must fetch the writings from the castle, or he should die. Then he went once more into the stable, and bemoaned himself, and said, Oh, my dear little white horse, now I'm to go away again. How am I to do it? Then the little white horse said he was just to load the ships full again. 
So it happened again as it had happened before, and the giants and the birds were satisfied, and made gentle by the meat. When they came to the castle, the white horse told Ferdinand the Faithful that he must go in, and that on the table in the princess's bedroom lay the writings, and Ferdinand the Faithful went in and fetched them. When they were on the lake, he let his pen fall into the water. Then said the white horse, Now I cannot help you at all. But Ferdinand remembered his flute and began to play on it, and the fish came with a pen in its mouth, and it gave it back to him. So he took the writings to the castle where the wedding was celebrated. The queen, however, did not love the king because he had no nose, but she would have much liked to love Ferdinand the Faithful. Once, therefore, when all the lords of the court were together, the queen said she could do feats of magic, and that she could cut off anyone's head and put it on again, and that one of them ought just to try it. But none of them would be the first, so Ferdinand the Faithful, again, at the instigation of Ferdinand the Unfaithful, undertook it, and she hewed off his head, and put it on again for him, and it healed together directly, so that it looked as if he had a red thread around his throat. Then the king said to her, My child, and where have you learned that? Oh, she said, I understand the art. Shall I just try it on you also? Oh, yes, said he. So she cut off his head, but did not try to put it on again, and pretended that she could not get it on, and that it would not stay. Then the king was buried, but she married Ferdinand the Faithful. He, however, always rode on his white horse, and once when he was seated on it, it told him that he was to go on to the heath which he knew, and gallop three times around it. And when he had done that, the white horse stood up on its hind legs, and was changed into a king's son. The Iron Stove In the days when wishing was still of some use, a king's son was bewitched by an old witch and shut up in an iron stove in the forest. There he passed many years and no one could rescue him. Then a king's daughter came into the forest, who had lost herself and could not find her father's kingdom again. After she had wandered about for nine days, she at length came to the iron stove. Then a voice came forth from it and asked her, Whence do you come, and whither are you going? She answered, I have lost my father's kingdom, and cannot get home again. Then the voice inside the iron stove said, I will help you get home again, and that indeed most swiftly, if you will promise to do what I desire of you. I am the son of a far greater king than your father, and I will marry you. Then was she afraid and thought, Good heavens, what can I do with an iron stove? But as much as she wished to go home to her father, she promised to do as he desired. He said, You shall return here, and bring a knife with you, and scrape a hole in the iron. And then he gave her a companion who walked near her, but did not speak, and in two hours he took her home. There was great joy in the castle when the king's daughter came home, and the old king fell on her neck and kissed her. She, however, was sorely troubled and said, Dear father, what I have suffered. I should never have got home again from the great wild forest if I had not come to an iron stove. But I have been forced to give my word that I will go back to it, set it free, and marry it. Then the old king was so terrified that he all but fainted, for he had but this one daughter. They therefore resolved that they would send in her place the miller's daughter, who was very beautiful. They took her there, gave her a knife, and said she was to scrape at the iron stove. So she scraped at it for four and twenty hours, but could not bring off the least morsel of it. When the day dawned, a voice from the stove said, It seems to me it is day outside. And then she answered, It seems to me too. I fancy I hear the noise of my father's mill. So, you are a miller's daughter. Then go your way at once, and let the king's daughter come here. Then she went away at once, and told the old king that the man outside there would have none of her. He wanted the king's daughter. Then the old king grew frightened, and the daughter wept. But there was a swineherd's daughter, who was even prettier than the miller's daughter. And they determined to give her a piece of gold to go to the iron stove instead of the king's daughter. So she was taken thither, and she also had to scrape for four and twenty hours. 
She, however, was no better at it. When the day broke, a voice inside the stove cried, It seems to me that it's day outside. And then answered she, So it seems to me also. I fancy I hear my father's horn blowing. Then you are a swineherd's daughter? Well, go away at once and tell the king's daughter to come, and tell her all must be done as promised, and if she does not come, everything in the kingdom shall be ruined and destroyed, and not one stone will be left standing on another. When the king's daughter heard that, she began to weep, but now there was nothing for it but to keep her promise. So she took leave of her father, put a knife in her pocket, and went forth to the iron stove in the forest. When she got there, she began to scrape, and the iron gave away, and when two hours were over, she had already scraped a small hole. Then she peeped in, and she saw a youth so handsome and so brilliant with gold and with precious jewels that her very soul was delighted. So she went on scraping and made the hole so large that he was able to get out. Then said he, You are mine, and I am yours. You are my bride, and have released me. He wanted to take her away with him to his kingdom, but she entreated him to let her go once again to her father, and the king's son allowed her to do so. But she was not to say more to her father than three words, and then she was to come back again. So she went home, but she spoke more than three words, and instantly the iron stove disappeared and was taken far away over glass mountains and piercing swords. But the king's son was set free and no longer shut up inside of it. After this she bade goodbye to her father, took some money with her, but not much, and went back to the great forest, and looked for the iron stove, but it was nowhere to be found. For nine days she sought it, and then her hunger grew so great that she did not know what to do, for she had nothing to live on. When it was evening, she seated herself on a small tree, and made up her mind to spend the night there, as she was afraid of wild beasts. When midnight drew near, she saw in the distance a small light, and thought, Ah, there! I should be saved. She got down from the tree and went towards the light, but on the way she prayed. Then she came to a little old house, and much grass had grown all about it, and a small heap of wood lay in front of it. She thought, Ah, whither have I come? And she peeped in through the window, but she saw nothing inside but toads, big and little, except a table covered with wine and roast meat, and the plates and glasses were of silver. Then she took courage and knocked at the door, and immediately the fat toad cried, Little green waiting maid, waiting maid with the limping leg, little dog of the limping leg, hop hither and thither, and quickly see who is without. And a small toad came walking by and opened the door for her. When she entered, they all bade her welcome, and she was forced to sit down. They asked, Where have you come from, and whither are you going? Then she related all that had befallen her, and how, because she had transgressed the order which had been given to her not to say more than three words, the stove, and the king's son also, had disappeared, and now she was about to seek him over the hill and dale, until she found him. Then the old fat toad said, Little green waiting maid, waiting maid with the limping leg, little dog of the limping leg, hop hither and thither, and bring me the great box. Then the little one went out and brought the box. After this, they gave her meat and drink, and took her to a well-made bed, which felt like silk and velvet, and she laid herself therein, in God's name, and slept. When morning came, she arose, and the old toad gave her three needles out of the great box, which she was to take with her. They would be needed by her, for she had to cross a high glass mountain, and go over three piercing swords and a great lake. If she did all of this, she would get her lover back again. Then she gave her three things, which she was to take the greatest care of, namely, three large needles, a plow wheel, and three nuts. With these she traveled onwards, and when she came to the glass mountain, which was so slippery, she stuck the three needles first behind her feet, and then before them, and so got over it, and when she was over it, she hid them in a place which she marked carefully. After this, she came to the three piercing swords, and then she seated herself on the plow wheel, and rolled over them. At last, she arrived in front of a great lake, and when she crossed it, she came to a large and beautiful castle. She went and asked for a place. She was a poor girl, she said, and would like to be hired. She knew, however, that the king's son, whom she had released from the iron stove in the great forest, was inside of this castle. 
and she was taken in as a scullery maid at low wages. But already the king's son had another maiden by its side whom he wanted to marry, for he thought that she had been long since dead. In the evening, when she had washed up and was done, she felt in her pocket and found the three nuts which the old toad had given her. She cracked one with her teeth, and was going to eat the kernel when, lo and behold, there was a stately royal garment inside of it. When the bride heard of this, she came and asked for the dress, and wanted to buy it, and said, It is not a dress for a servant girl, she said. No, she would not sell it, but if the bride would grant her one thing, she should have it and that was the permission to sleep one night in her bridegroom's chamber. The bride gave her permission because the dress was so pretty, and she had never had one like it. When it was evening, she said to her bridegroom, That silly girl will sleep in your room. If you are willing, so am I, said he. She, however, gave him a glass of wine in which she had poured a sleeping draught. So the bridegroom and the scullery maid went to sleep in the room, and he slept so soundly that she could not waken him. She wept the whole night and cried, I set you free when you were in the iron stove in the wild forest. I sought you and walked over a glass mountain and three sharp swords and a great lake before I found you, and yet you will not hear me. The servants who sat by the chamber door heard how thus she wept the whole night through, and in the morning they told it to their lord. The next evening, when she had washed up, she opened the second nut, and a far more beautiful dress was within it, and when the bride beheld it, she wished to buy that also. But the girl would not take money, and begged that she might once again sleep in the bridegroom's chamber. The bride, however, agreed, but gave him a sleeping draught again, and he slept so soundly that he could hear nothing. But the scullery maid wept the whole night long and cried, I set you free when you were in an iron stove in the wild forest. I sought you, and I walked over a glass mountain, and over three sharp swords and a great lake before I found you, and yet you will not hear me. The servant sat by the chamber door, and heard her weeping the whole night through once again, and in the morning they again informed their lord of it. And on the third evening, when she had washed up, she opened the third nut, and within it was a still more beautiful dress, which was stiff with pure gold. When the bride saw that, she wanted to have it, but the maiden only gave it up on condition that she might for the third time sleep in the bridegroom's apartment. The king's son, however, was on his guard and threw the sleeping draught away. Now, when she began to weep and cry, Dearest love, I set you free when you were in the iron stove in the terrible wild forest. The king's son leapt up and said, You are the true one, you are mine, and I am yours. Thereupon, while it was still night, he got into a carriage with her, and they took away the false bride's clothes so that she could not get up. When they came to the great lake, they sailed across it, and when they reached the three sharp cutting swords, they seated themselves on the plow wheel, and when they got to the glass mountain, they thrust the three needles in it, and so at length they got to the little old house. But when they went inside, it was a great castle, and the toads were all disenchanted, and were king's children and full of happiness. Then the wedding was celebrated, and the king's son and the princess remained in the castle, which was much larger than the castle of their fathers. But as the old king grieved at being left alone, they fetched him away and brought him to live with them, and they had two kingdoms, and lived happily in wedlock. A mouse did run. The story is done. The Four Skillful Brothers There was once a poor man who had four sons, and when they were grown up, he said to them, My dear children, you must now go out into the world, for I have nothing to give you. So set out, go abroad and learn a trade, and see how you can make your way. So the four brothers took their sticks, bade their father farewell, and went through the town gate together. When they had traveled about for some time, they came to a crossroads which branched off in four different directions. Then said the eldest, Here we must separate, but on this day, four years hence, we will meet each other again at this spot, and in the meantime we will seek our fortune. Then each of them went his way, and the eldest met a man who asked him where he was going and what he was intending to do. 
Well, I want to learn a trade, he replied. And then the other said, Come with me and be a thief. No, he answered. That is no longer regarded as a reputable trade, and the end of it is that one has to swing on the gallows. Oh, said the man, you need not be afraid of the gallows. I will only teach you to get such things as no other man could ever lay hold of, and no one will ever detect you. So he allowed himself to be talked into it, and while with the man, he became an accomplished thief, and so dexterous that nothing was safe from him if he once desired to have it. The second brother met a man who put the same question to him, what he wanted to learn in the world. I don't know yet, he replied. Then come with me and be an astronomer. There is nothing better than that, for nothing is hid from you. He liked the idea and became such a skillful astronomer that when he had learnt everything and was about to travel onwards, his master gave him a telescope and said to him, With that you can see whatever takes place, either on earth or in heaven, and nothing can remain concealed to you. A huntsman took the third brother into training and gave him such excellent instructions in everything which related to huntsmanship that he became an experienced hunter. When he went away, his master gave him a gun and said, It'll never fail you. Whatsoever you aim at, you're certain to hit. The youngest brother also met a man who spoke to him and inquired what his intentions were. Would you not like to be a tailor? said he. Not that I know of, said the youth. Sitting doubled up from morning till night, driving the needle of the goose backwards and forwards? Mm, that's not to my taste. Oh, but you are speaking in ignorance, answered the man. With me, you should learn a very different kind of tailoring, which is respectable and proper, and for the most part very honorable. So he let himself be persuaded, and he went away with the man and learned his art from the very beginning. When they parted, the man gave the youth a needle and said, With this you can now sew whatever is given you, whether it is as soft as an egg or as hard as steel, and it will all become one piece of stuff, so that no seam will be visible. When the appointed four years were over, the four brothers arrived at the same time at the crossroads, embraced and kissed each other, and returned home to their father. So now, said he, quite delighted, the wind has blown you back again to me. They told him of all that had happened to them, and that each had learned his own trade. Now they were sitting just in front of the house under a large tree, and the father said, I will put you all to the test, and see what you can do. Then he looked up and said to his second son, Between two branches up at the top of this tree, there's a chaffinch's nest. Tell me how many eggs there are in it. The astronomer took his glass, looked up and said that there were five. And then the father said to the eldest, Fetch the eggs down without disturbing the bird which is sitting hatching them. The skillful thief climbed up and took the five eggs from beneath the bird, which never observed what he was doing, and remained quietly sitting where she was, and brought them down to his father. The father took them, and put one of them on each corner of the table, and the fifth in the middle, and said to the huntsman, With one shot you shall shoot me the five eggs in two, through the middle. The huntsman aimed, and shot the eggs, all five as the father has desired, and that at one shot. He certainly must have had some of the powder for shooting around corners. Now it's your turn, said the father to the fourth son. You shall sew the eggs together again, and the young birds that are inside them as well, and you must do it so that they are not hurt by the shot. The tailor brought his needle and sewed them as his father wished. When he had done this, the thief had to climb up the tree again and carry them to the nest and put them back under the bird without her being aware of it. The bird sat her full time, and after a few days the young ones crept out, and they had a red line around their necks where they had been sewn together by the tailor. Well, said the old man to his sons, you really ought to be praised to the skies. You have used your time well, and learnt something good. I can't say which of you deserves the most praise. That will be proved if you have but an early opportunity of using your talents. Not long after this, there was a great uproar in the country, for the king's daughter was carried off by a dragon. The king was full of trouble about it, both by day and night, and caused it to be proclaimed that whosoever brought her back should have her as their wife. 
The four brothers spoke amongst each other and decided that this would be a fine opportunity for them to show what they can do, and they resolved to go forth together and liberate the king's daughter. The astronomer said that he would soon find out where she was, and he looked through his telescope and said that he could see her already, and that she was far away from where they were at, on a rock in the sea, and that the dragon was beside her, watching her. He then went to the king and asked for a ship for himself and his brothers, and sailed with them over the sea until they came to the rock. Sure enough, there the king's daughter was sitting, and the dragon was lying asleep on her lap. The huntsman took a look and decided that he dare not fire, as he could kill the beautiful maiden and the dragon at the same time. The thief said he would try his art, and he crept thither and stole her away from under the dragon, so quietly and so dexterously that the monster never even noticed it, but went on snoring. Full of joy, they hurried off with her on board the ship, and steered out into the open sea, but the dragon, who when he awoke and found no princess there, followed them and came snorting angrily through the air. Just as he was circling above the ship and about to descend on it, the huntsman shouldered his gun and shot him to the heart. The monster fell down dead, but was so large and powerful that his fall shattered the whole ship. Fortunately, however, they laid hold of a couple of planks and swam about the wide sea. Then again they were in great peril, but the tailor, who was not idle, took his wondrous needle and with a few stitches sewed the planks together, and they seated themselves upon them and collected together all the fragments of the vessel. Then the tailor sewed those so skillfully together that in a very short time the ship was once more seaworthy and they could go home again in safety. When the king once more saw his daughter, there was great rejoicings. He said to the four brothers, One of you shall have her to wife, but which of you it is to be, you must settle amongst yourselves. Then a heated argument arose among them, for each of them preferred his own claim. The astronomer claimed that if he had not seen the princess first, all of their arts would have been useless, so he thought that she was his. The thief then claimed that even seeing her would have been useless had he not gotten her away from the dragon. He also claimed that she should be his. The huntsman made a claim that the princess and all of his brothers would have been torn to pieces by the dragon if he had not shot him in the heart, so he stated that the princess should have been his. The tailor claimed that if not by his art, and had he not sewn the ship together again, they all would have been miserably drowned, so he decided that she was his. Then the king pronounced his verdict. Each of you has an equal right, and as all of you cannot have the maiden, none of you shall have her. But I will give to each of you, as a reward, half of a kingdom. The brothers were pleased with this decision, and decided it is better thus than they should be at variance with each other. Then each of them received half of a kingdom, and they lived with their father in the greatest happiness, as long as it pleased God. One eye, two eyes, and three eyes. There was once a woman who had three daughters, the eldest of whom was called One Eye, because she had only one eye in the middle of her forehead, and the second daughter, Two Eyes, because she had two eyes like other folks, and the youngest was named Three Eyes, because she had three eyes, and her third eye was also in the center of her forehead. However, as Two Eyes saw just as other human beings did, her sisters and her mother could not endure her. They said to her, You, with your two eyes, you're no better than the common people. You do not belong to us. They pushed her about and threw old clothes to her, and gave her nothing to eat but what they had left, and they did everything that they could to make her unhappy. It came to pass that Two Eyes had to go out into the fields to tend to the goat, but she was still quite hungry, because her sisters had given her so little to eat. So she sat down on a ridge and began to weep, and so bitterly that two streams ran down from her eyes. And once, when she looked up in her grief, a woman was standing beside her who said, Why are you weeping, little Two Eyes? Two Eyes answered, Have I not reason to weep, when I have two eyes like the other people, and my sisters and mother hate me for it, and push me from one corner to the other, throw old clothes at me, and give me nothing to eat but the scraps they leave? Today they have given me so little that I am still quite hungry. 
Then the wise woman said, Wipe away your tears, two eyes, and I will tell you something to stop your ever suffering from hunger ever again. Just say to your goat, Bleat, my little goat, bleat. Cover the table with something to eat, and then a clean, well-spread table will stand before you with the most delicious food upon it, of which you may eat as much as you are inclined for. And when you have had enough, and have no more need of the little table, just say, Bleat! Bleat, my little goat, I pray, and take the table quite away, and then it will vanish again from your sight. Hereupon the wise woman departed, but two eyes thought, I must instantly make a trial, and see if what she said is true, for I am far too hungry. And then she said, Bleat, my little goat, bleat, cover the table with something to eat. And scarcely had she spoken the words than a little table, covered with a white cloth, was standing there, and on it was a plate with a knife and fork, and a silver spoon, and the most delicious food was there also, warm and smoking as if it had just come out of the kitchen. Then too I said the shortest prayer that she knew, Lord God, be our guest forever, amen. And she helped herself to some food, and she enjoyed it. And when she was satisfied, she said, as the wise woman had taught her, Bleat, bleat, my little goat, I pray, and take the table quite away. And immediately, the little table and everything on it was gone again. That is a delightful way of keeping house, thought Two Eyes, and was quite glad and happy. In the evening, when she went home with her goat, she found a small earthenware dish with some food, which her sisters had set ready for her, but she didn't even touch it. Next day she again went out with her goat, and left the few bits of broken bread which had been handed to her lying untouched. The first and second time that she did this, her sisters did not notice it at all, but as it happened every time, they did observe it, and said, There's something wrong about Two Eyes. She always leaves her food untasted, and she used to eat up everything that was given to her. She must have discovered other ways of getting food. In order that they might learn the truth, they resolved to send one eye with two eyes when she went to drive her goat to the pasture, to observe what two eyes did when she was there, and whether anyone brought her anything to eat or drink. So when two eyes set out the next time, one eye went with her and said, I will go with you to the pasture, and see that the goat is well taken care of, and ensure the goat is driven where there is food. But Two Eyes knew what was in One Eye's mind, and drove the goat into high grass and said, Come, One Eye, we will sit down, and I will sing something to you. One Eye sat down and was tired with the unaccustomed walk and the heat of the sun, and Two Eyes sang constantly. One Eye, are you waking? One Eye, are you sleeping? Until One Eye shut her one eye and fell asleep. And as soon as Two Eyes saw that One Eye was fast asleep, and could discover nothing, she said, Bleat, my little goat, bleat! Cover the table with something to eat! She seated herself at her table, and ate and drank until she was satisfied, and then she again cried, Bleat, bleat, my little goat, I pray, and take the table quite away! And in an instant, all had vanished. Two Eyes now awakened One Eye and said, One Eye, you want to take care of the goat and go to sleep while you're doing it. But in the meantime, the goat might run all over the world. Come, let us go home again. So they went home, and again, Two Eyes let her dish stand untouched, and One Eye couldn't tell her mother why she would not eat it, and to excuse herself said, I fell asleep when I was out. The next day, the mother said to Three Eyes, This time you shall go and observe if Two Eyes eats anything when she is out, and if anyone fetches her food and drink, for she must eat and drink in secret. So Three Eyes went to Two Eyes and said, I will go with you and see if the goat is taken proper care of and driven where there is food. But Two Eyes knew what was in Three Eyes' mind and drove the goat into the high grass and said, We will sit down and I will sing something to you, Three Eyes. Three Eyes sat down and was tired with the walk and with the heat of the sun, and Two Eyes began the same song as before and saying, Three Eyes, are you waking? But then instead of singing, Three Eyes, are you sleeping? As she ought to have done, she thoughtlessly sang, 
two eyes are you sleeping? And saying all the time. Three eyes are you waking? Two eyes are you sleeping? Then two of the eyes which three eyes had shut and fell asleep. But the third, as it had not been named in the song, did not sleep. It is true that Three Eyes shut it, but only in her cunning, to pretend it was asleep too, but it blinked and could see everything very well. And when Two Eyes thought that Three Eyes was fast asleep, she used her little charm. Bleat, bleat, my little goat, bleat. Cover the table with something to eat. She ate and drank as much as her heart desired, and then ordered the table to go away again. Bleat, bleat, my little goat, I pray and take the table quite away. And Three Eyes had seen everything. Then Two Eyes came to her, waked her, and said, Have you been asleep, Three Eyes? You keep watch very well. Come, we will go home. And when they got home, Two Eyes again did not eat, and Three Eyes said to the mother, Now, I know why that haughty thing there does not eat. When she is out, she says to the goat, Bleat, bleat, my little goat, bleat. Cover the table with something to eat. And then a little table appears before her, covered with the best of food, much better than we have here even. And when she has eaten all she wants, she says, Bleat, bleat, my little goat, I pray, and take the table quite away. It all disappears. I watched everything closely. She put two of my eyes to sleep by means of a charm, but luckily the one on my forehead kept awake. Then the envious mother cried, Do you want to fare better than we do? The desire shall pass from you. And she fetched a butcher's knife and thrust it into the heart of the goat, which fell down dead. When two eyes saw that, she went out full of sadness, seated herself on the ridge of the grass at the edge of the field, and wept bitter tears. Suddenly, the wise woman once more stood by her side and said, Two eyes, are you weeping? Have I not reason to weep? She answered. The goat which covered the table for me every day when I spoke your charm, that goat has been killed by my mother, and now I shall again have to bear hunger and want. The wise woman said, Two eyes, I will give you a piece of good advice. Ask your sisters to give you the entrails of the slaughtered goat, and bury them in the ground in front of the house, and your fortune will be made. Then she vanished, and Two Eyes went home and said to her sisters, Dear sisters, do give me some part of my goat. I don't wish for what is good, but give me the entrails. Then they laughed and said, If that's all you want, you can have it. So Two Eyes took the entrails and buried them quietly in the evening in front of the house door as the wise woman had counseled her to do. Next morning when they all awoke and went to the house door, there stood a strangely magnificent tree with leaves of silver and fruit of gold hanging among them, so that all in the wide world there was nothing more beautiful or precious. They did not know how the tree could have come up there during the night, but Two Eyes saw that it had grown up out of the entrails of the goat for it was standing on the exact spot where she had buried them. Then the mother said to One-Eye, Climb up, my child, and gather some of the fruit of the tree for us. One-Eye climbed up, but when she was about to get hold of one of the golden apples, the branch escaped from her hand, and that happened each time, so that she could not pluck a single apple, let her do what she might. Then said the mother, Three eyes, you climb up. You, with your three eyes, you can look about better than one eye. One eye slipped down, and three eyes climbed up. Three eyes was not more skillful, and might try as she would, but the golden apples always escaped her. At length, the mother grew impatient, and climbed up herself, but could get a hold of the fruit no better than one eye and three eyes, for she always clutched empty air. Then said two eyes, Let me go up. Perhaps I may succeed better. The sisters cried, You indeed, with your two eyes. What can you do? But two eyes climbed up, and the golden apples did not avoid her, but came into her hand of their own accord, so that she could pluck them one after the other, and brought a whole apronful down with her. The mother took them away from her, and instead of treating poor two eyes any better for this, 
she and one eye and three eyes were only envious, because two eyes alone had been able to get the fruit, and they treated her still more cruelly. It so befell that once when they were all standing together by the tree, a young knight came up. Quick, two eyes, cried the two sisters. Creep under this, and don't disgrace us. And with all speed they turned an empty barrel, which was standing close by the tree, over the top of two eyes, and they swept the golden apples which she had been gathering under it too. When the knight came nearer, he was a handsome lord, who stopped and admired the magnificent gold and silver tree, and he said to the two sisters, To whom does this fine tree belong? Anyone who would bestow one branch of it on me might in return for it ask whatsoever he desired. Then one eye and three eyes replied that the tree belonged to them, and that they would give him a branch. They both took great trouble, but they were not able to do it, for the branches and fruit both moved away from them every time. Then said the knight, It is very strange that the tree should belong to you, and that you should not have the power to break a piece off of it. They again asserted that the tree was indeed their property. Whilst they were saying so, two eyes rolled out a couple of golden apples from under the barrel to the feet of the knight, for she was vexed with one eye and three eyes for not speaking the truth. When the knight saw the apples, he was astonished and asked where they had come from. One eye and three eyes answered that they had another sister who was not allowed to show herself, for she only had two eyes like any common person. The knight, however, desired to see her and cried, Two eyes, come forth! And then two eyes, quite comforted, came from beneath the barrel, and the knight was surprised at her great beauty and said, You two eyes can certainly break off a branch from the tree for me. Yes, replied two eyes, that I certainly shall be able to do, for the tree actually belongs to me. And she climbed up, and with the greatest of ease broke off a branch with beautiful silver leaves and golden fruit, and gave it to the knight. Then said the knight, Two Eyes, what shall I give you for it? Alas, answered Two Eyes, I suffer from hunger and thirst, grief and want, from early morning until late at night. If you would take me with you and rescue me, I should be happy. So the knight lifted Two Eyes onto his horse and took her home with him to his father's castle, and there he gave her beautiful clothes and meat and drink to her heart's content. And as he loved her so much, he married her, and the wedding was solemnized with great rejoicing. When Two Eyes was thus carried away by the hands of night, her two sisters grudged her good fortune in downright earnest. The wonderful tree, however, still remains with us, thought they, and even if we can gather no fruit from it, still everyone will stand still and look at it and come to us and admire it. Who knows what good things may be in store for us? But the next morning, the tree had vanished, and all their hopes were at an end. And when Two Eyes looked out of the window of her own room, to her great delight, the tree was standing in front of it, and so it had followed her. Two Eyes lived a long time in happiness. Once two poor women came to her castle and begged for alms. She looked in their faces and recognized her sisters, one eye and three eyes, who had fallen into such poverty that they had to wander about and beg their bread from door to door. Two Eyes, however, made them welcome and was kind to them and took care of them, so that they both, with all their hearts, repented the evil that they had done to their sister in their youth. Fair Catrin Algae and Piff Paff Paltry. Good day, Father Holland. Many thanks, Piff Paff Paltry. May I be allowed to have your daughter? Oh, yes. If Mother Malchow Milch Cow, Brother High and Mighty, Sister Cassatrout, and Fair Catrin Algae are willing, you can have her. Where is Mother Malchow then? She's in the cow house milking the cow. Good day, Mother Malcho. Many thanks, Piff Peff Poultry. May I be allowed to have your daughter? Oh, yes. If Father Harland, Brother High and Mighty, Sister Cassatrout, and Fair Catronelge are willing, you can have her. Where is Brother High and Mighty then? 
Well, he is in the room chopping some wood. Good day, Brother High and Mighty. Many thanks, Piff Path Paltry. May I be allowed to have your sister? Oh, yes. If Father Holland, Mother Maljo, Sister Cassatrapt, and Fair Cat Chanelje are willing, you can have her. Where is Sister Cassatrapt then? Well, she is in the garden cutting cabbages. Good day, Sister Cassatrapt. Many thanks, Piff Path Poultry. May I be allowed to have your sister? Oh, yes. If Father Holland, Mother Malcho, Brother High and Mighty, and Fair Catronalge are willing, you may have her. Where is Fair Catronalge then? She's in the room counting out her farthings. Good day, Fair Catronalge. Many thanks, Piff Path Poultry. Will you be my bride? Oh, yes. If Father Holland, Mother Malcho, Brother High and Mighty, and Sister Cassatrout are willing, I am ready. Fair Catronalgy, how much dowry do you have? Fourteen farthings in ready money, three and a half groschen owing to me, half a pound of dried apples, a handful of pretzels, and a handful of roots, and many other things are mine. Have I not a dowry vine? Piff Paff Paltry, what is your trade? Are you a tailor? Something better. A shoemaker? Something better. A husbandman? Something better. A joiner? Something better. A smith? Something better. A miller? Something even better. Perhaps a broom maker? Yes, that is what I am. Is that not a fine trade? The Shoes That Were Danced to Pieces There was once upon a time a king who had twelve daughters, each one more beautiful than the other. They all slept together in one chamber, in which their beds stood side by side, and every night when they were in them the king locked the door and bolted it. But in the morning when he unlocked the door, he saw that their shoes were worn out with dancing, and no one could find out how that had come to pass. Then the king caused it to be proclaimed that whosoever could discover where they danced at night should choose one of them for his wife and be king after his death, but that whosoever came forward and had not discovered it within three days and nights should have forfeited his life. It was not long before a king's son presented himself and offered to undertake the enterprise. He was well received and in the evening was led to a room adjoining the princess's sleeping chamber. His bed was placed there, and he was to observe where they went and danced, and in order that they might do nothing secretly or go away to some other place, the door of their room was left open. But the eyelids of the prince grew heavy as lead, and he fell asleep, and when he awoke in the morning, all twelve had been to the dance, for their shoes were standing there with holes in all the soles. On the second and third nights there was no difference, and then his head was struck off without mercy. Many others came after this and undertook the enterprise, but all forfeited their lives. Now it came to pass that a poor soldier, who had a wound and could serve no longer, found himself on the road to the town where the king lived. There he met an old woman who asked him where he was going. Well, I hardly know myself, answered he, and added in jest. I had half a mind to discover where the princesses danced their shoes into holes, and thus become a king. <laughs> Well, that is not so difficult, said the old woman. You must not drink the wine which will be brought to you at night, and you must pretend to be sound asleep. With that, she gave him a little cloak and said, If you wear this, you will be invisible, and then you can steal after the twelve. When the soldier had received this good advice, he fell to in earnest, took heart, went to the king, and announced himself as a suitor. He was as well received as the others, and royal garments were put upon him. He was conducted that evening at bedtime into the antechamber, and as he was about to go to bed, the eldest daughter came and brought him a cup of wine, but he had tied a sponge under his chin, and he let the wine run down into it without drinking a drop. 
Then he lay down, and when he had lain a while, he began to snore, as if in the deepest sleep. The twelve princesses heard that, and laughed, and the eldest said, He too might as well have saved his life. With that, they got up, opened up wardrobes, presses, cupboards, and brought out pretty dresses, dressed themselves before the mirrors, sprang about, and rejoiced at the prospect of the dance. Only the youngest said, I know not how it is. You are very happy, but I feel very strange. Some misfortune is certainly about to befall us. You are a goose who is always frightened, said another sister. Have you forgotten how many king's sons have already come here in vain? I hardly any need to give the soldier a sleeping draft. The booby would not have awakened anyway. When they were all ready, they looked carefully at the soldier, but he had closed his eyes and did not move or stir, so they felt themselves safe enough. The eldest then went to her bed and tapped it, whereupon it immediately sank into the earth, and one after the other, it ascended through the opening, the eldest going first. The soldier, who had watched everything, tarried no longer, put on his little cloak, and went down last with the youngest. Halfway down the steps, he just trod a little on her dress. She was terrified at that and cried out, What is that? Who's pulling on my dress? Don't be silly, said the eldest. You've caught it on a nail. Then they went all the way down, and when they were at the bottom, they were standing in a wonderfully pretty avenue of trees, all the leaves of which were silver and shone and glistened. The soldier thought, I must carry a token away with me, and broke off a twig from one of them, on which the tree cracked with a loud report. The youngest sister cried out again, Something is wrong. Did you hear that crack? But the eldest said, It's a gun fired for joy, because we've gotten rid of our prince so quickly. After that they came into an avenue where all the leaves were of gold, and lastly into a third where they were of bright diamonds. The soldier broke off a twig from each, which made such a crack each time that the youngest started back in terror, but the eldest still maintained that the sounds were salutes. They went on and came to a great lake whereon stood twelve little boats, and in every boat sat a handsome prince, all of whom were waiting for the twelve, and each took one of them with him, but the soldier seated himself by the youngest. Then her prince said, I wonder why the boat is so much heavier today. I shall have to row with all my strength if I am to get it across. What should cause that? said the youngest. But the warm weather? I feel very warm too. On the opposite side of the lake stood a splendid brightly lit castle from whence resounded the joyous music of trumpets and kettle drums. They rode there, entered, and each prince danced with the girl he loved, but the soldier danced with them unseen, and when one of them had a cup of wine in her hand he drank it up so that the cup was empty when she carried it to her mouth. The youngest was alarmed at this, but the eldest always silenced her. They danced there until three o'clock in the morning, and when all the shoes were danced into holes, and they were forced to leave off, the princes rode them back again over the lake, and this time the soldier seated himself by the eldest. On the shore they took leave of the princes, and promised to return the following night. When they reached the stairs, the soldier ran on the front lawn and lay down in his bed. And when the twelve would come up slowly and wearily, he was already snoring so loudly that they could all hear him, and they said, So far as he is concerned, we are safe. They took off their beautiful dresses, laid them away, put the worn-out shoes under their beds, and lay down. The next morning the soldier was resolved not to speak, but to watch the wonderful goings-on, and again went with them the second and the third night. Each night everything was just as it had been on the first time, and each time they danced until their shoes were worn to pieces. But the third time he took a cup away with him as a token. When the hour had arrived for him to give his answer, he took the three twigs in the cup and went to the king, but the twelve stood behind the door and listened for what he was going to say. When the king put the question, Where have my twelve daughters danced their shoes to pieces in the night? He answered, In an underground castle with twelve princes and he related how it had come to pass, and brought out the tokens. The king then summoned his daughters, and asked them if the soldier had told the truth, and when they saw that they were betrayed, and that falsehood would be of no avail, they were obliged to confess all. Thereupon the king asked which of them he would have to his wife. He answered, I am no longer young, so give me the eldest. Then the wedding was celebrated on the selfsame day, and the kingdom was promised to him after the king's death. 
But the princes were bewitched for as many days as they had danced nights with the twelve. The Six Servants In olden times there lived an aged queen who was a sorceress, and her daughter was the most beautiful maiden under the sun. The old woman, however, had no other thought than how to lure mankind to destruction, and when a wooer appeared, she said that whosoever wished to have her daughter must first perform a task or die. Many had been dazzled by the daughter's beauty and had actually risked this but they never could accomplish what the old woman enjoined them to do, and then no mercy was shown, and they had to kneel down, and their heads were struck off. A certain king's son, who had also heard of the maiden's beauty, said to his father, Let me go there. I want to demand her in marriage. Never, answered the king. If you were to go, it would be going to your death. On this, the son lay down and was sick unto death, and for seven years he lay there, and no physician could heal him. When the father perceived that all hope was over, with a heavy heart he said to him, Go thither, and try your luck, for I know no other means of curing you. When the son heard that, he rose from his bed, and was well again, and joyfully set out on his way. And it came to pass that as he was riding across the heath, he saw from afar something like a great heap of hay lying on the ground, and when he drew nearer, he could see that it was the stomach of a man who had laid himself down there, but the stomach looked like a small mountain. When the fat man saw the traveler, he stood up and said, If you are in need of anyone, take me into your service. The prince answered, What can I do with such a clumsy man? Oh, said the stout one, this is nothing. When I really puff myself up, I am three thousand times fatter. Well, if that's the case, said the prince, I can make use of you. Come along with me. So the stout one followed the prince, and after a while they found another man who was lying on the ground with his ear laid up to the turf. What are you doing there? asked the king's son. I am listening, replied the man. What are you listening to so attentively? I am listening to what is just going on in the world, for nothing escapes my ears. I even hear the grass growing. Tell me, said the prince, what you hear at the court of the old queen who has the beautiful daughter. Then he answered, I hear the whizzing sound of the sword that is striking off a wooer's head. The king's son said, Well, I can make use of you. Please come with me. They went onwards and then saw a pair of feet lying and part of a pair of legs, but they could not see the rest of the body. When they had walked on for a great distance, they came to the body, and at last to the head also. Why, what a tall rascal you are, said the prince. Oh, replied the tall one, that is nothing at all yet. When I really stretch out my limbs, I am three thousand times as tall, and taller than the highest mountain on earth. I will gladly enter your service if you will take me. Please come with me, said the prince. I can make use of you. They went onwards and found a man sitting by the road who had bound up his eyes. The prince said to him, Have you weak eyes that you cannot look at the light? No, replied the man, but I must not remove the bandage, for whatsoever I look at with my eyes splits to pieces. So powerful is my glance. If you can use that, I shall be glad to serve you. Come with me, replied the king's son. I can make use of you. They journeyed onwards and found a man who was lying in the hot sunshine, trembling and shivering all over his body, so that not a limb was still. How can you shiver when the sun is shining so warm? said the king's son. Alas, replied the man, I am of quite a different nature. The hotter it is, the colder I am, and the frost pierces through all my bones, and the colder it is, the hotter I am. In the midst of ice, I cannot endure the heat nor in the midst of fire the cold. You are a strange fellow, said the prince, but if you will enter my services, please follow me. They traveled onwards and saw a man standing who made a long neck and looked about him and could see over all of the mountains. What are you looking at so eagerly, said the king's son. The man replied, 
I have such sharp eyes that I can see into every forest and every field, the hill and the valley, all over the world, the prince said. Come with me if you will, for I am still in want of such a one. And now the king's son and his six servants came to the town where the aged queen dwelt. He did not tell her who he was, but said, If you will give me your beautiful daughter, I will perform any task you set me. The sorceress was delighted to get such a handsome youth as this into her net, and said, I will set you three tasks, and if you are able to perform them all, you shall be husband and master of my daughter. But what is the first task to be? You shall fetch me a ring which I have dropped into the Red Sea. So the king's son went home to his servants and said, The first task is not easy. A ring is to be got out of the Red Sea. Come, find some way of doing it. And then the man with the sharp sight said to him something to the effect of, I will see where it is lying. And then he looked down into the water and told the king's son that he could see it hanging there on a pointed stone. The tall man came and carried them thither and then said something to the effect of how he could soon get it out if he could only see it. The stout one stepped up, laid down, and put his mouth to the water, on which all the waves fell into his mouth just as if it had been in a whirlpool, and he drank up the whole sea until it was as dry as a meadow. The tall one stooped down a little and brought out the ring with his hand. Then the king's son rejoiced when he had the ring, and he took it to the old queen. She was absolutely astonished and said, Yes, this is the right ring. You have safely performed the first task, but now comes the second. Do you see the meadow in front of my palace? Three hundred fat oxen are feeding there, and these must you eat, skin, hair, bones, horns, and all. And down below in my cellar lie three hundred casks of wine, and these you must drink up as well. And if one hair of the oxen or one little drop of wine is left, your life will be forfeited to me. Well, may I invite no guest to this repast? inquired the prince. No dinner is good without some company. The old woman laughed maliciously and replied, You may invite one for the sake of companionship, but no more. The king's son went to his servants and said to the stout one, You shall be my guest today, and shall eat your fill. Hereupon the stout one puffed himself up, and ate three hundred oxen without leaving one single hair, and then he asked if he was to have nothing but his breakfast. Then he drank the wine straight from the casks without feeling any need of a glass, and drained them down to their dregs. When the meal was over, the prince went to the old woman and told her that the second task was also performed. She wondered at this and said, No one has ever done so much before, but one task still remains. She thought to herself, You shall not escape me, and you will not keep your head on your shoulders. This night, said she, I will bring my daughter to you in your chamber, and you shall put your arms around her. But when you are sitting there together, beware of falling asleep. When twelve o'clock is striking, I will come, and if she is then no longer in your arms, you are lost. The prince thought, This task is easy, but well, I will most certainly keep my eyes open. Nevertheless, he called his servants, told them what the old woman had said, and remarked, Who knows what treachery lurks behind this? Foresight is a good thing. Keep watch, and take care that the maiden does not go out of my room again. When night fell, the old woman came with her daughter, and gave her into the prince's arms, and then the tall one wound himself around the two in a circle, and the stout one placed himself by the door, so that no living creature could enter. There the two sat, and the maiden spoke never a word, but the moon shone through the window on her face, and the prince could behold her wondrous beauty. He did nothing but gaze at her, and was filled with love and happiness, and his eyes never felt weary. This lasted until eleven o'clock, when the old woman cast such a spell over all of them that they fell asleep, and at that self-same moment the maiden was carried away. They all slept soundly until a quarter to twelve, and the magic lost its power, and they all awoke again. Oh, misery and misfortune, cried the prince. Now I am lost. The faithful servants also began to lament, but the listener said, Be quiet, I want to listen. 
Then he listened for an instant and said, She is on a rock, three hundred leagues from hence, bewailing her fate. You alone, tall one, can help her. If you will stand up, you will be there in a couple of steps. The tall one agreed with this and stated that the one with the sharp eyes must go with him, and that way they could destroy the rock. Then the tall one took the one with the bandaged eyes on his back, and in the twinkling of an eye they were on the enchanted rock. The tall one immediately took the bandage from the other's eyes, and he did but look around, and the rock shivered into a thousand pieces. Then the tall one took the maiden in his arms, carried her back in a second, then fetched his companion with the same rapidity, and before it struck twelve, they were all sitting as they had sat before, quite merrily and happily. When twelve struck, the aged sorceress came stealing in with a malicious face, as much as to say, Now he is mine! for she believed that her daughter was on the rock three hundred leagues off. But when she saw her in the prince's arms, she was alarmed and said, Here is one who knows more than I do. She dared not make any opposition, and was forced to give him her daughter. But she whispered in her daughter's ear, It is a disgrace to you to have to obey common people, and that you are not allowed to choose a husband to your own liking. On this, the proud heart of the maiden was filled with anger, and she meditated revenge. The next morning she caused three hundred great bundles of wood to be got together, and said to the prince that though the three tasks were performed, she would still not be his wife until someone was ready to seat himself in the midst of the wood and bear the fire. She thought that none of his servants would let themselves be burned for him, and that out of love for her, he himself would place himself upon it, and then she would be free. But the servant said, Every one of us has done something except for the frosty one. He must set to work. And they put him in the middle of the pile, and then they set fire to it. Then the fire began to burn, and burnt for three days until all the wood was consumed. And when the flames had burnt out, the frosty one was standing amid the ashes, trembling like an aspen leaf, and saying, I have never felt such a frost during the whole course of my life. If it had lasted much longer, I should have been benumbed. As no other pretext was to be found, the beautiful maiden was now forced to take the unknown youth as a husband. But when they drove away to the church, the old woman said, I cannot endure this disgrace. And she sent her warriors after them with orders to cut down all who opposed them and bring back her daughter. But the listener had sharpened his ears and had heard the secret discourse of the old woman. What shall we do? said he to the stout one. But he knew what to do, and spat out once or twice behind the carriage some of the sea water which he had drunk, and a great lake arose in which the warriors were caught and drowned. When the sorceress perceived that, she sent her mailed knights, but the listener heard the rattling of their armor, and undid the bandage from one eye of sharp eyes, who looked for a while rather fixedly at the enemy's troops, on which they all sprang to pieces like glass. Then the youth and the maiden went on their way undisturbed, and when the two had been blessed in church, the six servants took leave, and said to their master, Your wishes are now satisfied. You need us no longer. We will go our way and seek our own fortunes. Half a league from the palace of the prince's father was a village near which a swineherd tended his herd, and when they came thither, the prince said to his wife, Do you know who I really am? I am no prince, but a herder of swine, and the man who is there with that herd, that is my father. We two shall have to set to work also, and help him. Then he alighted with her at the inn, and secretly told the innkeepers to take away her royal apparel during the night. So when she awoke in the morning, she had nothing to put on, and the innkeeper's wife gave her an old gown and a pair of worsted stockings, and at the same time seemed to consider it a great present, and said, if it were not for the sake of your husband, I should have given you nothing at all. Then the princess believed that he really was a swineherd, and tended the herd with him, and thought to herself that she had deserved this for all of her haughtiness and pride. This lasted for a week, and then she could endure it no longer, for she had sores on her feet. And now came a couple of people who asked if she knew who her husband was. She answered that she did, that he was a swineherd, and that he had just gone out with the cords and ropes to try to drive a little bargain. The people said, Oh, just come with us, and we'll take you to him. And they took her up to the palace, and when she entered the hall, there stood her husband in kingly raiment, 
But she didn't recognize him until he took her into his arms, kissed her, and said, I suffered so much for you that you too had to suffer for me. And then the wedding was celebrated. And he who has related this wishes that he too had been present at it. Thank you again for sharing your time with us. Sweet dreams. <laughs>